60 Minutes Rewind. During his time, Anthony Casso was the country's most feared gangster. As we first reported back in September, he was once the boss of New York's Lucchese crime family. He ruled by extorting, intimidating, or murdering not only his mob rivals, but legitimate businessmen, law enforcement officials, and anyone else who got in his way. After Casso was arrested in 1993, he cut a deal with the government to testify against the mob in exchange for leniency. The deal fell apart, but not before Casso gave prosecutors a detailed history of how he took control of some of this country's leading industries, and how he personally participated in the murders of 36 people. That's right, 36 people. We met Casso at the Metropolitan Correctional Center in New York City, just before he was shipped out to a maximum security prison to serve a life sentence. Not one, but 13 life sentences, plus 455 years. Despite a lifetime of violence and treachery, Casso says nothing beats being a mafia boss. It's uh, better than being a Hollywood star. No matter where you go with your family, they don't know what to do for you, the people. I mean, don't get me wrong, they know you're a gangster, they know, you're, they know what you are. They go all out for you. Like go to restaurants, you don't wait online. They'll get you a table right away. You'll get the best of foods, the best of wines. So why did these people treat you that way? Because they knew I was, I was uh, with organized crime. They knew I was a mafia member. And as a mafia member, Casso was an unusually menacing figure the reputation for being hot-tempered and sadistic. Take the case of Jimmy Heidel, a rival mobster who was tapped to kill Casso. Heidel botched the job, only wounding him, and then Casso hunted Heidel down. I took him to a place that I had prearranged, somebody's house that I could use. I brought him in there, sat him down. I wanted to know why I was shot, and who told you, and who else was involved, and who, you know, and who, who told you, who gave you the orders to shoot me. After you were finished with it, you killed him. Right. Was it just one shot to the head? No, I didn't shoot him in the head. I didn't shoot him. I was in somebody's house. You make a mess. I shot him a couple of times. I, I didn't. I didn't torture the kid. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything like that. I shot him a couple of times. The kid died. Well, what's a couple? Uh, uh, more than a couple. It's a couple. I, I, uh, really, I don't know the exact amount. Maybe I shot him. Uh, 10 times, 12 times. Maybe 15 even. It could have been 15. Why? That's the that? hatred I had for him. I wanted to beat him with the gun after it was empty. He just tried to kill me. He doesn't deserve anything. That's the law anyway. That was your law? That's the law of the, of, the, law of the mafia. Casso learned so the law of the shot. mafia as a young boy. He was groomed by his late father, Michael, a mob enforcer in the 1930s and 40s. Since I was eight, nine years old, I grew up in this atmosphere, and they used to always, you know, they wanted to dress me like a little gangster, put a suit on me, a hat, go against the wall, take a picture, put one hand in your pocket, you know, old things like that, you know. As a teenager, Casso worked as a longshoreman on the docks in Brooklyn, the right place to be, he says, if you were a thief. If I needed a few dollars extra that day, I would just take something, put it on a truck, sell it to the truck driver, and that would be it. So if you were unloading the ship, isn't there somebody there watching what you're doing? Yeah, but they were all doing the same thing I'm doing. <laughs> doing the same thing. Did it ever occur to you to try to earn a, a legitimate living, to have a nine-to-five job? I did have a nine-to-five job, and I was still a thief. And I was a good thief. With exceptional talents as a hitman and a moneymaker, Casso quickly rose to the top of the Lucchese family. In 1990, with law enforcement closing in on him, Casso became a fugitive, which landed him a spot on the FBI's wanted list. After a nationwide manhunt, Casso was finally captured in 1993. He's really, really within a world of criminals that are bad people, that are killers, who are, who are just treacherous, deceitful people, he stands out. Valerie Caproni was the assistant U.S. attorney in charge of Casso's case. She says Casso knows no limits. 
he was involved in a conspiracy to murder a federal judge. He was involved in a conspiracy to murder a federal prosecutor. He murdered and authorized the murder of witnesses. I mean, these sorts of crimes are beyond the pale. Casso ended up pleading guilty to more than a hundred crimes, and in hopes of getting out of jail one day, he, like several other high-ranking mobsters before him, turned on his mafia family and became a government informant. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. In 1996, hidden behind a curtain, Casso, who was in the Federal Witness Protection Program, testified on Capitol Hill and exposed the Mafia's lucrative partnership with Russian organized crime groups, which owned hundreds of gas stations in the New York area. Tying in and Russian organized crime made large amounts of money by working scams to avoid paying tax on gasoline. Don't you guys take a, a, a blood oath not to talk about the Mafia to anyone outside of the family? Isn't there a code of silence, omerta, isn't that what it's called? Right. What happened to all of that? I could see there was the handwriting on the wall. There was no, the, all the old timers were gone. There was nobody honorable left out there. And this was my time to depart. So let me try to get back, you know, the few years I got back uh, left with my life, I wanted to try to hit the streets again. Casso told the government all about the mafia's day-to-day -day operations in places like this, New York City's Garment Center. For decades, the mafia has had a stranglehold on business here, siphoning off tens of millions of dollars every year in illegal profits from clothing manufacturers who then pass on those costs to consumers. Casso says he made $5 million a year doing business this way. His information helped net dozens of arrests and gave prosecutors a rare inside look at how the mafia controls legitimate industries. You can't move a garment in there unless uh, we tell you what trucker to use, who to deal with, and what you have to pay. Because we control the unions. When you say you control the union, what do you mean? The organized crime's putting their people in there to be the union representatives. All right, I'm going into business. I'm going to open up Bradley Suits. I, I make men's clothing down there on 7th Avenue. But suppose I say, look, I've got these truckers over here who are going to move my suits. These are the people I want to use. I don't want to see your people. What happens? First thing they're going to do is go grab the trucker and tell him not to pick your work up. Now you're going to be sitting with all your work ready to sh be shipped out, and there's going to be nobody pick it up. They're going to look to attack you in another way. Maybe get in your shop, destroy your merchandise, you know, until you come along, until you finally join up and sign up with them. Will they go after me? Possibility. You know, they would, they would rather make a deal with you than uh, do any harm to you. When they make the deal and, and they, I agree to make these payments, do I make them in, in, in cash, in, 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 in checks? In cash. What we do is all money is collected every month. Lucchese family gets 50%, the Genovese family gets 25%, and the Gambino family gets 25% of the money. That's, that's, how, that's how it's divvied up. Suppose I say to this union representative, look, I've got hidden tape recorders here. I've recorded all of this. I'm going to the FBI. What happens then? What do you think? <laughs> it's going to happen. They, they would look to kill you. If you did that, they would look to kill you. If you think he's kidding, consider what happened to Robert Kubeka and his brother-in-law, Donald Barstow, two law-abiding businessmen who stood up to Anthony Casso and the Mafia's control over garbage hauling, an industry the mob runs just the way it runs the garment center. Kubeka and Barstow operated a small, private garbage hauling business out on Long Island. After refusing repeated demands to pay the mob a fee to stay in business and fed up with death threats and damage to their property, in 1982, the two men agreed to work undercover for the government. That was more than Anthony Casso and the Mafia were going to put up with. Uh, once they were marked that they were informing on the association, on the garbage industry, we want to protect our interests. And the next step is, you know, you, the only way to get rid of them is you would have to kill them. And then finally, that's what it came to. Early one morning, as Robert Kubeka and Donald Barstow were opening for business, two men sent by Anthony Casso quietly walked in and fired 10 shots, killing Kubeka and Barstow. They were legitimate businessmen, yes. family men. They were trying to run a business, 
fair and above board. They had wives, children. They were ordered killed. Do you have any regrets about that? I don't have any regrets about I don't. I never knew them. I don't know their wife and children. But uh, it's, just, it's just like business with us. I don't have any feelings about it one way or the other. That's what had to be done. The story will continue after this. Despite his involvement in 36 murders, Anthony Casso's cooperation agreement with the government had all but guaranteed that one day he would get to walk out of prison, but not anymore. Prosecutors recently ripped up their agreement with Casso, saying he repeatedly committed crimes in prison after becoming an informant, that he bribed guards to have goods smuggled in, that he assaulted another inmate, and that he made false accusations against other mob witnesses. In all likelihood, Casso will now spend the rest of his life behind bars. If you want to be a gangster, be a gangster. If you want to be a government witness, come and be a government witness. You can't straddle the line because we are going to pull the plug on the cooperation agreement if we catch you doing that. And with Casso, that's exactly what happened. It was his decision not to come on board 100%, not ours. Casso says he was double-crossed, that the government used him for his information and then broke its agreement over what he insists were minor infractions. Casso now says he regrets his decision to become an informant, a decision he says he made over the strong objections of his immediate family, which feared the mob would retaliate against them. I got an older brother. He was over there crying like a baby. And how could you do it? And what about us? Look what you're doing to us. You're ruining our lives. You know. And then my daughter got on the phone. I says to her, I made a deal with them. I gave them my word. I'm going to keep my word. And for the government, I went against my daughter's wishes. And now you think the government hung you out to dry? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. You get emotional about your family. Yes. It's understandable. You love them very much, you miss them. Very much. What about all the people who've been hurt in the course of your years in this mafia business? You, you pled guilty to more than 100 crimes, participating in some level in 36 murders. Right. What about the families of those people? I look, I don't, I didn't know them, so I really, I, uh, personal feelings. I gotta, uh, I gotta be honest. I, I didn't, I, I didn't know them. You don't have any trouble sleeping at night. You don't have a bad conscience about all of over the victims' families. No, I don't. And if somebody says bribery, extortion, participation in murder, actually killing somebody, he deserves to be in prison. He doesn't deserve a deal. What they, do you say? I say they're right, one hundred percent. If I had to go to jail for my crimes, I, I, I should never come out of jail. I don't deserve any sympathy from anybody or anything. But I deserve the deal I made. They should honor the deal I made. Citing the government's decision to tear up his cooperation agreement, Anthony Casso is appealing his multiple life sentences. For now, he sits in solitary confinement 23 hours a day.